So basically, we are going to talk about international relations, international relations and uh, politics. Why are we talking about politics in a course about philosophy of science? Well, many reasons. One is that political science is a science, and so this is philosophy and methodology of the natural and the social sciences. So right now, supposedly, we are talking about social sciences. Uh, and I want to give at least some... Because mm, again, again, remember, remember, we're talking about this picture from protons to presidents and from electrons to elections. So let's get to presidents, right? And um, um, I'm not sure where we should begin. In some sense, maybe we'll do this in parallel and talk about uh, uh, international relations and internal politics at the same time, at the same time. But, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, this is Okay, whatever. Uh, anyway, so, and, and actually, we are going to be looking. Have you seen the home assignment? Did you like it? We're going to be looking at the Marxist perspective. Interesting question why Marxist perspective? Well, uh, let me give you a short answer if possible. So we only have time for one perspective, so I had to pick one. And uh, Marxism, especially if you go to the International Relations Department, from the standpoint of, uni of the University of London, Marxism is a very important paradigm. But it's not all of international relations, obviously, but, but that's a start. And basically, in some sense, um, if you want to look at uh, other paradigms, that's fine too, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, that's number, reason number one. Uh, but maybe more important reason why Marxism and not some other paradigm is because, um, see, consensus side of the issue again. I keep talking about this all the time. So conflict, consensus. Uh, interesting set of terms uh, I keep circling around in my head and we keep coming back to from time to time. Um, the, the question being, is society, and in our, in our case, international society or like, local political society is it primarily a seat of conflict or is it a seat of consensus you know uh, ultimately the view that is espoused by people like Aristotle that man is by nature political animal society does not uh, restrict us society enables us somebody like Hegel will talk about this um, in the national sphere but also in the international sphere and what I'm trying to say is that um, the standard account that people are usually given, like if you switch on the TV, is mostly going to be the consensus account. And actually, if you take your uh, economics textbooks, you're also given a consensus account. You remember, like the paradigm of international relations, the kind of things that you study in, ma in macroeconomics is uh, two countries and they trade, one produces, I don't know, guns, the other one butter, or wh whatever, whatever is, uh, whatever is uh, in vogue these days. Um, and it's it's a it's a it's a win win. Do you remember? It's a win win situation. It's always profitable to trade. International trade is always a good idea. Protectionism and nationalism is always a bad idea. According to your uh, first year, and second year, and actually third year, whatever uh, uh, economics textbooks. So what I'm trying to say is that you have enough exposure to consensus accounts, as far as I'm concerned. So I want to look at the most important conflictual account, which is again for, again, uh, which, which is, uh, in a certain objective sense, uh, Marxism, again, objective in one sense, in the sense that if you open a textbook in international relations from the University of London, not, not from some uh, uh, damn full technical school that teaches you how to uh, tie your shoes, or actually it doesn't, it doesn't even teach you that, uh, uh, but if you actually open, you know, University of London, Marxism is going to be an important paradigm. So we're, we're going to start there, and actually we're going to finish there as well. But I, I'm going to leave it uh, to you to fill, in, to fill in the gaps. That's okay, I mean, as, as, uh, as Confucius, uh, put it, you know, you learn one trade and seven others will be revealed to you. Something like that. Uh, so we'll, we'll, you know, I, pre I prefer to uh, talk about one approach in depth rather than ten approaches superficially. Okay, so mm -hmm. when we talk about Marxism and especially in terms of international relations and uh, uh, internal politics, and again, I remind you that um, this, 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 there's going to be this question of communism at the back of our heads from time to time. And uh, ultimately, I want to break that. You see, I mean, if we, if we spend time talking about communism, we are, we're wasting time. Because Marx does not write about communism. Marx is valuable and important as an analyst of capitalism. 
You know, of the 10,000 pages that Marx wrote, he devotes like three to communism. So we're not interested in that. Not to mention that, as I told you in our lecture on communism, it's not clear whether Marx believes that communism is a good idea, and it's also not clear if he thinks that it's feasible. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with some of the issues in a second. So uh, um, let me, by way of introducing um, the two topics I want to talk about, more or less simultaneously, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see which one we begin with as the class progresses. Let me, um, again, pick up where we left off, where we left off with Marx. Now, um, serious scholars of Marx, like Michael Borowai, would say that there are three problematic issues in Marx. And I'm not sure, I have to think about that. Is it, is it really, are these the three most important issues? I'm not sure, okay? I have to think about that, but preliminary, preliminary. The three issues are, first of all, the theory of class struggle. Um, that we are only talking about two classes, and we are talking uh, uh, for Marx, so there are only two classes, and also he talks about how the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the class struggle intensifies, and therefore the revolution is automatic. Now yeah, in an important sense, I'm not going to be interested in Marxism uh, in a second, you know, because we, we want to explain the world today, but this is a good uh, segue into what I want to talk about in a second. The second issue um, is the theory of transition. Uh, related to this. Transition from communism to capitalism. And, 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 and again, specific, specifically how, how it is, especially in the Communist Manifesto, it is supposed to be automatic. But when, then, in later Marxist writings, Marx himself realizes that uh, it probably would not be automatic. Uh, and you actually need uh, uh, organization. Uh, active political organization in order to bring that about. And um, number three, um, the theory of uh, state. I'm not sure if it's, this is the best order, but something like that. Because, again, in the Communist Manifesto, uh, Marx talks about st the state as a committee for managing the common affairs of the bourgeoisie, just a committee for managing the common affairs of the bourgeoisie. But later on, Marx himself uh, uh, and later, important Marxists after Marx talk about uh, relative autonomy of the state. Relative autonomy. How the state can, um, can have a logic of its own, and uh, maybe, you know, to oversimplify, how the state can save capitalism from itself. Mm, why is he here today? If I to try to course talk about this, it's very unfortunate that he's not here. He would benefit from this lecture. Anyway, well, I have. So, um, these are the three issues. So, basically, and again, in an important respect, from the very beginning, in the Marxist picture, it's difficult to separate the international sphere from the national sphere, um, for many reasons. One of the reasons, immediately, is that, remember, uh, when we talk about Marx, there was this issue when he talks about British workers and Irish workers, British and Irish workers, and this notion that if the British and Irish workers try to fight their, for their rights by themselves, they are doomed to failure because capitalism can simply use the tactic of divide and conquer and just move the industry to a different country and, uh, well, basically, you know, abusing the concentration of economic power to force the workers on the pain of starvation to accept their, um, accept their terms you know, contractual terms. And it's, it's, you know, it's fairly easy to see, especially in the contemporary world in the 21st century, how if a country passes certain kinds of restrictive labor laws, in the sense that uh, restrictive uh, from the standpoint of, of businesses, like you impose certain regulations on business, it's very easy. Well, it's not, well, like it's not costless, but it is relatively easy for the uh, corporations to just move their production elsewhere. And again, in, in Marx, there was this very important uh, issue of the reserve army of unemployed, reserve army of unemployed, and reserve army of unemployed is global, already for Marx, reserve army of unemployed. And of course, today, and <laughs> uh, one of Marx's predictions is that as long as the present system of capitalism stays the way it is, uh, we will not solve the problem of Africa. Because Africa, functionally speaking, serves as a very important reserve army of unemployed for the rest of the world, and it is against the core interests of uh, 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 global business elites to do something about it. So you can, you can uh, uh, donate to African charities as much as you want, 
but the, the global business elite will make sure that your money is spent only in such a way as so as to preserve this reserve army of unemployed. Again, these uh, 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 you know issues, uh, what's that? Healthcare and child mortality and uh, 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 birth clinics, all that kind of stuff that seem to make people's lives better, but actually increase the population and increase the reserve of army of unemployed. So always, big question, big question. Are these charities really charities, or are they doing more harm than good? Uh, difficult question. John Stuart Mill has something to say about this. The alleged father of modern liberalism says that uh, in a country over peopled, to uh, bear children over and above the minimum necessary, the maximum necessary limit is a crime against everybody who earns their uh, uh, wage through labor in the market. And uh, John Stuart Mill proposes prison sentences for people who give birth to children not being able to uh, bring them up in proper conditions, properly educate them, etc., etc. John Stuart Mill is not a Marxist. Okay? John Stuart Mill is the father of modern liberalism. So negative liberty, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so this is a digression, but something maybe uh, for people to think about in their spare time. So anyway, so um, sort of talking about this, all over the place at, oh, at the same time. But um, let's, let's, let's start somewhere. And um, you know, we'll see how it goes. And the place where I would want to begin is probably, with, again, with another liberal theorist. Well, liberal in the broad sense of the term. His name is uh, John Hobson. John Hobson. Now, nobody knows this guy. You've never heard this name before. John Hobson. And he's writing before the First World War. So he's a British liberal before the First World War. And uh, well, he actually, he becomes uh, a very important influential because Lenin reads Hobson. And uh, Lenin relies on Hobson in his analysis to a large extent. And, um, but again, Hobson is not a Marxist. Hobson is not a Marxist. So basically, okay. So basically, um, Hobson is like a, you know this uh, Adam Smith style liberal, and uh, he is he is a big big believer in competition, competitive competitive uh, market liberalism, and but at the same time in the middle of his day, so we are talking about the end of the nineteenth, the beginning of the twentieth century before the First World War. He talks about how there are power groups, cliques, cliques of businessmen and of politicians who um, abuse the state machinery for their own private gain. So he is for competition, but what he actually sees are monopolies and concentration of power. And uh, um, well, this is this is this story. This story is not new. Obviously, you've heard about this. I'm, I'm sure. But, but the, the question is, um, um, what to do about it? Now, more specifically. More specifically, mm, what he does is says that you know business interests of the nation as a whole are subordinated to those of certain sectional interests that usurp the control of national resources and use them for private gain. And um, so, more specifically, yeah, well, okay, I probably should not look for the quote right now. Maybe we'll, you know, I can look it, uh, it, 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 I can look it up later. But the, the key issue that he focuses on is imperialism. Imperialism. So, Britain has an expansionistic foreign policy. Again, on the one hand, we can talk about this. Uh, uh, and I, I understand I'm talking about everything at the same time. Maybe, you know, at the beginning of second class, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Uh, I try to do this in a more orderly fashion. But, um, again, if we talk about international relations, international relations, Marxism, to a very important extent, is, extent, is a theory of international relations. Because, again, from, from um, international relations follow from the core of Marxist analysis. How specifically? Specifically, um, well, again, Marx in one sense. What is the most important conclusion? Well, Adam Smith talks about the wealth of nations. How that in a well-regulated economy, you achieve universal opulence, wealth for all, such that 
again, even the most frugal peasant, is richer than an African king. So in some senses, if any of you are familiar with John Rawls, maybe from last year, this notion of maximum, the maximization of the welfare of the least advantaged individual, these seem to be the terms in which Adam Smith talks about capitalism. That capitalism is justified and capitalism is good to the extent that capitalism provides wealth for all, including for the poorest or the poorest members of the population. And this is the moral justification of capitalism for Adam Smith. Not rights, but utility. And more specifically, utility for all. Now, this is where Marx comes in, because again, his most important work, Best Capital, is the so called critique of political economy. Critique of political economy. So it's actually, it's not a critique of capitalism as it exists, it's a critique of the model of capitalism as, 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 it, as it is proposed by people like Adam Smith. And more specifically, uh, Marx's one liner is that, again, Adam Smith says capitalism provides, provides wealth for all, and Marx says no. Under capitalism, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now, um, there's an important side note I need to make because there are ways you can manipulate statistics today uh, uh, to try to answer this question. Is it, is it really the case that the rich still get richer and the poor still get poorer? And uh, um, my one-liner is that yes, if you look at the statistics right way, in the right way. You, you, should, you should see this trend even today. Now, it's tricky, and I should come back to it. So let me, let me make a note to come back to talking about statistics. Although, although as I say this, of course, this is obviously it's an empirical question. So if you look at, you know, if you, if you, if you can enlighten me, if you, can, if, you, if you are reading those statistics is different, I would be more than happy to talk to you. Because uh, remember, skeptic first, Marxist second. So uh, uh, I think it would be uh, sort of interesting to talk about this. Uh, critically and in details. To what extent is this true? So anyway, so the rich get richer and the, and the poor get poorer. And um, uh, we talked about how, again, the idea is that um, there's a certain thing which you, you may, if you want, in a, in, a, in a somewhat judgmental fashion, call wage theft, wage theft, that uh, 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 surplus value is expropriated from the workers and uh, taken by capitalists. And very characteristically, very characteristically, capitalists do not spend this, but invest this money. And if you take money, which could have been spent on consumption, and you redirect it to investment, obviously you are looking down the barrel of a gun, which is called the crisis of overproduction. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure, maybe again, maybe talk about this in, in the seminar, or maybe in the second lecture, but there's, there's a very straightforward mathematical equation by which you can show how uh, this type of uh, economics has to lead to crisis of oil production. And again, if you look at places like the United States of America, where approximately 50% of the population own nothing, have literally nothing. And this is supposed to be the rich and prosperous country of the world, the American dream, right? But the half of the population, the, the liabilities uh, exceed their assets. So the question is why they're not starving, and the answer is very simple, because they live on credit. credit. But that's exactly the situation we're talking about. Again, crisis of global production. There are too many goods to produce. People cannot afford them, and therefore the banks have to give loans, and these loans will never be repaid. And which is why, again, Marxist analysis of the crisis of 2008 is that it is a crisis of global production which has been shifted into the, um, into the uh, banking sphere. But again, essentially, it is a crisis of global production. So how do you get, how does this generate international relations? Well, obviously, because, um, 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 well, in addition to being you know, uh, sources of uh, 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 cheap labor and also of uh, um, cheap resources, so I'm talking about external markets, external markets. External markets, in addition to these two, also very importantly, provide outlets for goods and capital. And this is how you get international relations. And again, you see, if you talk seriously today about theories of globalization, you know, if you take subjects which actually do try to look at and explain the world outside the window as it really is, as opposed to, you know, castles in the sky, uh, um, what, you know, it, it is impossible to talk about globalization without talking about capitalism. Again, Marx very famously in the Communist Manifesto talks about how the cheap prices of commodities, and again, why, why is there a cheap price of commodities? Because of technological progress, which is endemic to capitalism. Again, especially this competitive capitalism at, at, at its early stage. And maybe, you know, 
you know, let's continue talking about everything at the same time. It's fun. Uh, uh, some Marxists would say that this is the first competitive progressive stage of capitalism, and this is the second late degenerate stage of capitalism. Well, um, opinions may vary, and again, always, always think back to Max Weber, always let's keep Max Weber in our hearts. Could it be that these are ideal types and the real world is a combination of two? And yes, maybe we're mostly in the second stage, which is monopoly degenerate capitalism, but still there's some competition somewhere, so it is at least to some extent progressive. And again, there's this guy in your home assignment, I'm not sure if you paid attention to, whose name is Bill Warren, I think, Bill Warren, who keeps talking about how, um, how capitalism has not finished doing its productive work, that it is, and again, you guys not here today, it's such a shame, uh, that it is uh, too early, too early for communism, because uh, capitalism has not finished its historical mission. So let me go back a step to Marx. So Marx, in the, in the Communist Manifesto, talks about how capitalism is the best thing that has ever happened to humanity. Again, competitive, competitive capitalism gives you uh, technological progress. Technological progress leads to these cheap goods and uh, um, companies in competition with each other. And again, Marx thinks this is good. This is wonderful and necessary for communism regardless of this question whether communism is possible or not. Mm -hmm. Again, Marx is important as an analyst of, cap of capitalism. And again, somebody who points out very important, positive, progressive role. Again, communism is not here. So capitalism, of the actual existing conditions for Karl Marx, is the best thing that has happened to humanity. I cannot stress this enough. Anyway, so let me go back a, a step to this. Internationalization. So international, so yeah, yeah, again, so if you look at theories of globalization, it is impossible to overlook the importance of global capitalism. And more specifically, again, capitalism through competition is forced to look for new markets, again, firms competing with one another, make the world globalized. And Marx thinks, among other people, that this, this is an excellent thing, again, that this unites the whole world into a single place, destroys feudalism, which Marx thinks is, is, is uh, bad and wrong for his own reasons, again. <laughs> Feel free to disagree, uh, but still. Um, mm. So, again, internationalization of trade, internationalization of labor, and, uh, um, you know, Marx would say it's good, but if you want to be a neutral social scientist, let's not use the words good or bad. We are not asking whether, it's, whether globalization is good or bad. We're asking why does globalization happen? And, again, one important reason to choose Marxism to talk about this uh, uh, topic, because, again, Global capitalism seems to play the most important, the most crucial role in terms of historical explanation, regardless of whichever approach you take. Uh, in the sense that, again, at the root of globalization, we have search for new markets. Again, let me, let me repeat what's written there on the board. So there are, there are at least four reasons. Maybe I'm forgetting something, but these are good ones to start. So immediately, it seems cheap labor and, re and cheap sources of resources. This is fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, country, you know, companies compete against one another, but also remember, capitalist countries compete against one, one another. Like, for example, Britain competes against France, competes against Germany, and this is what, what is driving the so-called new imperialism, which happens at the time of John Hobson, this uh, uh, um, new imperialism at the end of the 19th century, or second half of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, basically up until the First World War. Hmm. So this is, this is important, it's there. But also, in addition to this, uh, Marx is going to talk about outlet, outlet for goods, because again, so, uh, uh, talking about everything at the same time, but let's go back one step. We talk about crisis of overproduction, crisis of overproduction, that there's a certain amount of money that is taken out of circulation. So there's a certain amount of money, I don't know, let's, let's, let's uh, uh, call it uh, uh, delta M, whatever that is taken out of circulation, and this is exactly the same, uh, this is not mathematical, but whatever. Now, it's exactly equal to uh, uh, to amount of money, so, 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 so this, this, becomes, this becomes investment, this becomes investment, and this is exactly the amount of money that is uh, uh, not going to be consumed. Um, so, I'm a capitalist, I do not pay my workers enough money, again, some Marxists would call this wage theft, my workers consume less, but also this money I now invest. So immediately, so this gives rise to two surpluses. This is surplus of goods, which are not consumed, and this is surplus of capital, which needs to be invested. And there's only so much space to invest at home. So abroad, you need foreign markets, very, impor very important to uh, uh, sell your goods to, but also to find 
new places to invest. And this is why, uh, again, at the root for Marx, capitalism necessarily leads to globalization. very quickly, and I want to go back to Hobson. So if you look at this picture, remember, in volume one, one of Das Kapital, well, remember, right, uh, Marx talks about how capitalism drives itself into the ground through the crisis of overproduction. This is what Marx says in the first volume. But the first volume talks about only a very abstract model of the economy. Already in volumes two and three, we introduce sectors of the economy, different, different industries, and also, very importantly, we introduce international trade. And when you look at the picture this way, that there are, that there are these safety valves to which excess goods and excess capital can escape, immediately it becomes clear that this problem number two, or, or maybe maybe this problem number one, talking about the class struggle, that uh, 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 rich get rich, poor get poorer, Class struggle, class struggle intensifies, and basically, basically, again, Marx in Das Kapital talks about how the bourgeoisie forces the workers to unionize within the country, forces the unions to unite across countries, and, and forces them, in some sense, to bring about the uh, um, um, proletarian revolution. And again, in this, in this classical base superstructure style, how the base causes the changes in the superstructure. But immediately, if you look at this, what happens is that if, you're, if you're, the world economy is large enough, you can keep shuffling the crises around the world. Now, very famously, Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Luxemburg thought this would not happen, and thought that uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, there will be such a huge crisis that will grind all of the world economy to a halt when, when all of the markets have been incorporated to the global system. And then the revolution will happen automatically. But, but again, and you know, it's, I suppose it's thinkable, but somebody like Lenin comes in and says, no, no. If the capitalists are intelligent about uh, international investment, again, the global market is um, basically uh, resilient enough to tolerate local crises without the whole system tipping into overdrive mode, tipping into global crisis. Again, spreading out the crises of world production, spreading them geographically and also spreading them out in time. And this would, this would prevent one huge crisis that would lead the whole world to, to a stop. And so immediately, immediately, somebody like Lenin, well, you, you can see rudiments of this in Marx, but you can see this in Lenin very importantly, that the base alone does not give the revolution. You need intervention from the superstructure. And uh, uh, Lenin talk, talks about this avant-garde party, avant-garde uh, party, who has to engage in real political organization of international proletariat. But you see immediately, as soon as you start talking about these politics, and again, this notion of real political power, so there needs to be this party, which is really committed to the goals of revolution, which needs to try to unite trade unions across the globe. And at every step of the way, the question arises, arises will this party be successful? And the answer is no, it's, it's, it's not in the given, it's not in the cards. It's not in the cards. There's nothing inevitable about this revolution anymore. And in fact, uh, in some sense, you could say it's maybe to some extent working against the grain of uh, the forces of history. So, uh, uh, you know, in an important respect, maybe it's not so surprising that communist revolutions were not successful, and this, was, this is already there in the, um, this can already be seen there in the, um, in the theories themselves. Again, not to mention something very important that, again, communist revolution can only be global revolution, which encompasses the whole world. For reasons I don't necessarily want to go into, but you know, we can talk about this some other time. So, um, how does this tie to politics at home? How does this political situation abroad, how does this tie to politics at home? Am I, am I still attacking Dur uh, 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 Descartes? To some extent, I suppose. But um, well, 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 let me keep this conflict consensus on the board. Uh, um, 
before before I talk about politics at home and abroad, again, let's remind ourselves that what we're talking about is an ideal type. Likely, likely, I mean, or at least at least a good first guess, a good first guess is that real politics, both national and international, is a com is some combination of the two ideal types, conflictual and consensus ideal types. Even, you know, we're going to talk about Wallerstein in a second. Um, even the radical, radically conflictual Marxists, I'm sure, would recognize that there are certain things which the global community does in a consensus-like fashion. Uh, fighting, uh, what was this? Pulmonary, pulmonary pneumonia, some, you know, some uh, global epidemic threats, or something like that. So it is, it is or, or who knows? Who knows what's going to happen with uh, global warming? Maybe this will drive the international community to, uh, you know, operate uh, uh, together and to solve the usual prisoner's dilemma problems. But still, we're, we, right now, right now, we're trying to wrap our heads around this ideal type of the conflictual situation. So the conflictual situation basically looks like this. Uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe I should start with Wallerstein and then proceed to Gramsci. Is Wallerstein a good introduction to Gramsci? I suppose. But I want to talk about both. Um, so, okay, so there's this wonderful guy whose name is Emmanuel Wallerstein, and hopefully he's still alive. I hope he's still alive. Or did he die, like, recently? Yeah, he died, like, this spring or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 and, again, he's American, so he, he calls himself Wallerstein. But for some reason, in Russia, people call him Wallerstein. But, but he himself, again, he pronounces his name as Wallerstein. Um, and, uh, um, Wallerstein talks about uh, the so-called, again, it's called a, a very cryptic phrase, so-called world system theory. World system theory. And um, more specifically, we are talking about this uh, um, structure of uh, core periphery and semi-periphery. So the core semi-periphery. And periphery. So what are we talking about? So these would be capitalist countries, which are high in capital and which produce capital intensive goods. These countries of the periphery, they are low in capital, but they are rich in labor, and they produce labor intensive goods. Uh, semi periphery I'll talk about in a second. So, again, if you think back to this example of uh, uh, your macroeconomic analysis, uh, Britain and India, Britain and India, uh, uh, guns and butter, and your, like, again, standard Ricardian model uh, on which free trade is always beneficial to everybody. Well, again, imagine this situation. We're in the 19th century, and Britain produces uh, railway uh, Railway engines, basically. And uh, um, India produces grain to oversimplify the situation, right? Is this a fair trade? We see there's an important um, element of uh, market power. Few countries in the world produce railway engines. So Britain has a lot of leverage vis a vis India. Whereas grain, anybody can produce grain. So these, these industries, tend to be highly competitive, and therefore, the market power of individual producer is low, but also the market power of the country, which is based on the system, is also low. So, but these industries tend to be, because they're capital intensive, they tend to be highly monopolized. You know, think of uh, 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 nuclear warheads. Not many countries can produce them. And market power tends to be high. So the situation of free trade, the situation of free trade actually would favor Britain. This would be an unequal exchange. Britain would be in a position to extract the surplus from, from India. And um, if you think about this, so, so again, so we're talking about the, as some people call this, the development of underdevelopment. The development of underdevelopment. How, um, because the rules of the game are set by the countries of the poor, um, the periphery will not be allowed to industrialize um, in the same fashion to the same degree. 
So basically, a country like India will be perpetually kept in this uh, uh, labor-intensive state. Or at least, again, it's an ideal type, a tendency. A tendency is there. So, mm, how should we put this differently? Mm. What India needs in order to, let's say, start producing its own railway engines, or let's say, rocket engines, right, um, is protectionism. But the trouble is that, uh, you know, if Britain, sorry, if India tries to impose protective tariffs against the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom has a lot of power to mobilize against India. Uh, you know, these uh, trade wars, tariff, tariff wars, tariff wars can be really devastating for uh, weaker economies. That's point number one. But point number two, even if you could somehow get around that issue, there's always uh, um, the issue of military power. And, you know, let, let's not forget, not everything hinges on military power, but military power is important. And, uh, of course, some people don't always immediately recognize this, but to a large extent, especially in the contemporary world, but also, you know, in the past several hundred years, military power is first and foremost tied to economic power. Military power is tied to economic power, in the sense that military power is tied to economic capacity for production, production of uh, uh, weapons, uh, of uh, yeah. efficient, efficient weapons. And, I mean, it's probably not the worst time to remind everybody that the United States of America spends on military as much as the rest of the world combined. Let me, let me repeat that. If you take all the world's military spending, if you combine it, it's going to be less or approximately equal to the amount that America spends. So let's not forget about military power. So again, Marx talks about ideology, basic infrastructure, but again, military power is always there. Police power is always there. It's not the most important element for Marx, and it, 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 um, it is derived from economic power for Marx. Economic power is going to be more primary, but it, but it is an important element in the system. So I, you know, I'm sure this could be done in a, maybe in a more rigorous fashion, but at least preliminarily, this is what we're talking about. And the countries of the poor will be in a position to exploit the countries of the periphery. And again, again, if this is if this is too abstract, let's think about this in historical terms. The countries of the core are the countries of Europe, especially uh, in the beginning, Britain, France, maybe Germany to some extent, later United States of America. So we're talking about few advanced countries in the world which are in a position to uh, uh, dominate and exploit the rest of the world. Uh, my conservative Marxism um, uh, here uh, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? I don't know. You know we are talking about descriptions. Uh, uh, let's, let's think about evaluations uh, uh, elsewhere. But Marx himself does not think it's a bad thing. Marx himself thinks it's, it's good because this is, well, I don't want to say good like per se, but this is necessary in terms of historical progress. And this drives the progress of humanity uh, um, into the future, regardless of what. Yeah. We can think about this. Yeah. Uh, evaluations at a different time. Let's go back to this picture. So, and, and the countries of, of the periphery are numerous, and the countries of the poor can always employ the strategy of divide and conquer, of trying to pitch the countries of the periphery one against another. And so, you know, in some sense, Wallerstein says that this is a structure of power which emerges a long time ago, emerges basically in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it, it leads to globalization, and it leads to a certain particular unequal character of globalization. And this unequal character of globalization is preserved throughout the system, more or less. There is some shift. Some countries of the periphery shift into semi-periphery. Let me talk about this in a second. Some countries of the semi-periphery get into the core. So there is some mobility, some mobility in the system. But by and large, this is a rigid structure, rigid structure with a rigid core. Now, what are the countries of semi-periphery? Well, Wallerstein, again, in some sense, Always, Max Weber, ideal types, ideal types. Uh, Wallerstein doesn't want to talk about uh, semi-periphery goods. He thinks there are core goods which are capital intensive, and there are labor, labor intensive goods which are peripheral goods. He doesn't talk about this category in the middle. I should, you know, maybe we could think about this in the seminar. I'm not sure if I can think of real examples of these semi-periphery goods. What would they be like? But Wallerstein says that countries of semi-periphery are the countries that act as countries of the periphery vis-a-vis -vis the core, and edge as countries of the core vis-a-vis -vis the periphery. This is what he's talking about. 
So let's say if your country exports raw materials to the United States, but then exports high tech to Africa or something like that, then you are semi periphery. But again, semi he defines semi periphery as periphery vis a vis the core and core vis a vis the periphery. Now, the key issue, and immediately, I'm, we're talking about power, we're talking about political relations. Why is this important for political relations? And then, this guy, and then there's this guy, John Hobson, who is hanging out there, uh, and I, I, I need to get back to him. The problem with this picture is that, if you look at it, and again, Marx talks, Marx talks about two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And uh, in principle, it seems that he's right. It's appropriate to talk about just two classes. Yes, there's the middle class, but in the large scheme of things, there are so few that it's not really important for the purpose of analysis. The vast majority of the population on planet Earth are working class. They, they, they're forced to work, they must work. And uh, kind of preliminarily, this seems like a good analysis. But if you look at Wallerstein's picture, immediately, immediately you see a fatal flaw in Marxist uh, uh, notions. And the fatal flaw is this. How about we talk about not two classes, but about four classes? Anyways. We're talking about the bourgeoisie of the core, the proletariat of the core, and then of the bourgeoisie of the periphery and the proletariat of the periphery. Uh, unless you put on a certain glasses, these distinctions may not be obvious, but they are of momentous importance. And this is, again, one of the, I suppose, one of the most robust explanations why communist revolution is not happening anytime soon. Now, more specifically, what we're talking about is that, so these would, these would be the elites in the countries of the periphery, and, and these would be the elites uh, um, in the countries of the core. And the idea is that there are two distinct modes for these two elites to keep themselves in power. In the countries of the core, we are talking about concessions. We are talking about economic concessions. And in the countries of the periphery, we are talking about violence. So, uh -huh. so now we're getting from international relations to local politics. Have you seen uh, uh, CGP Gray's video, Rules for Rulers? No? Uh, seriously, it's a brilliant video. We watched it like 15 times. But you know, it's pretty good, but he doesn't talk about this, so it's, it's, not, it's not all that good. Anyway, but th there's, there's a reason, Marx would say, or Marxist analysis would say, there's a reason, there's a deep structural reason, which is ultimately economic, about why some countries today, in fact, most countries today are authoritarian, and only some countries are democratic, and even, even those countries which are democratic, the democracy in these countries are limited. And this is, this is the picture, this is the picture that we're getting. Again, this issue of concessions, uh, we can see this, already in people like Lenin, who has this wonderful phrase called the, the bourgeoisification of the proletariat. Bourgeoisification of the proletariat. When basically, again, the bourgeoisie in the advanced countries is this true democracy. Marxists would call this, Marxists would call this capitalist parliamentarism and not true democracy. Capitalist parliamentarism. They drop some breadcrumbs from the table to the proletariat to keep them pacified. Oh, this is, I, I, I almost hear echoes of Marcuse. Marcuse has exactly this, I mean, has, at some point, recounts this exact argument for a reason, of course, because Marcuse is a Marxist. Uh, uh, but again, the, this notion that what, what, what you are getting in the advanced countries is this situation where the elites stay in power and just uh, drop enough breadcrumbs to the to the proletariat to keep them pacified. And, and this allows a certain uh, democratic system or a certain illusion of a democratic system to persist. Whereas in the countries of the, of the periphery, it's not important. Uh, the elites, first of all, don't have breadcrumbs to give to the poor. And, and secondly, these are labor-intensive economies. You don't need education. You don't need you know, highly productive workforce. You need, you know, if your people are poor and hungry, excellent. They're, even, they're going to be even better laborers in your labor-intensive industries. Whereas in the countries of the core, you need, you need a population which is well taken care of, fed, clothed, you know, vaccinated, uh, but also, well, I, I, I suppose you also want to feed, clothed, and vaccinate your workers in the periphery so that they don't die in your factory. But here you want to invest in their human capital. You want to invest in their development. You want to, again, because this is capital intensive industries and this is labor intensive industries. Um, so, and, um, 
What Hobson basically says, <laughs> I'm kind of jumping all around the place, but again, Hobson is a liberal, and basically his, his idea, and Hobson is writing before Lenin, um, he's basically saying that, again, you have these sectional interests, so a minority of the country, he's talking about Britain at the end of the 19th century, sectional interests, so few, as he calls them, cliques, cliques, have you heard this uh, word before, cliques, clica. Uh, uh, well, basically, again, organized groups of uh, uh, powerful minorities in the country abuse the national um, interest in their own favor. And he thinks it's horrible for Britain, and he, you know, he wants to uh, uh, try to get out of this situation. But there are two important elements in this system. What do these cliques do specifically? Well, first of all, the first thing he talks about is military spending. Military spending. Because, again, again Hobson is writing well before Wallerstein. But the key idea is the same. The exchange between Britain and India is unequal. The exchange between Britain and India is, is unequal. And it's only kept uh, at, at bottom by military force. And so we have this military spending. Military spending, which is, uh, uh, again, in the interest of the British corporations against the interests of the majority of working British people. Hobson the liberal says. Not Hobbes, but Hobson, right? And um, the second, the second issue is nationalism, and this oh boy, this is such an important word, nationalism. This idea that again, the phrase it uses is that uh, the elites feign, feign, fake, si imitate, simulate national rivalries to keep the people pacified. So if somebody tries to speak out against this uh, exorbitant military spending, he's immediately branded as a traitor. What? Do you want Germany to win against Britain? Do you want, uh, or today? No, do you want America to spend less? Do you want China to win? Um, again, and, you know, in some sense, like if, if I had one word to say why communist revolution has failed, the nationalism, nationalism. Um, uh, and again, remember, in Marx, it is a crucial element of the system that, uh, that, that there has to be an internationalization of the workers' movement. The trade unions need to unite across the countries. And this is what prevents, this is what prevents them from doing that. And again, especially this nationalist rhetoric. Um, yeah, he says, um, so the new imperialism, which, again, new imperialism through, through this, uh, perpetuating, through military force, the system of unequal exchange um, um, only works in the interest of competing cliques of businessmen. And by the way, if you want to read about Thompson, he's in the supplementary reading for this class. Investors, contractors, export manufacturers, and certain professional classes. These cliques usurp the authority and the voice of the people and use the public resources, military spending, to push their private interest and spend the blood and money of the people in the vast and disastrous military game, feigning, faking, faking national antagonisms which have no basis in reality. It is not in the interest of the British people, either as producers of wealth or as taxpayers, to risk a war, like a war with Germany. But it may serve uh, the interest of a group of commercial politicians to, pr to promote this dangerous policy. Yeah, so long as this competitive expansion for territory and foreign markets, markets is permitted to misinterpret itself as national policy, the antagonism of interest seems real, and the people will sweat and bleed and toil to keep an ever more expensive machinery of war. And he also talks about, also very interesting, this is a detail, but this is such a juicy detail. He talks about how, again, 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 so, there's a huge military, and again, is this unrealistic? Is this 19th century Britain? No way, again, the United States of America spends as much as the rest of the world combined on military, whereas the population, 50% of the population own, own, own zero. It's an interesting situation. Can democracy, real democracy work in such conditions? Notice, I keep talking about breadcrumbs. Well, yeah, I mean, owning zero is kind of, sounds to me like breadcrumbs, but not much more than that. Anyway, but in addition to this, so, so the, the government spends a huge amount of money, which only serves the interests of the tiny minority of the bourgeoisie, um, and uh, um, clothes, clothes this spending in nationalist rhetoric, and brands anybody who tries to oppose that as a, uh, uh, as a traitor, but also, very importantly, this spending has to be hidden, has to be hidden by inflationary tax. Oh, this is so beautiful. That we are, we are not actually telling the people that they are spending the money. Because again, again, if you think about this, 
especially when you get a job, I know exactly to the cent, the kopeki, how much I pay to the Russian government. I know it. There's a set percentage. And this Russian government tried to increase taxes, I would know. I would be upset. Well, you could say that, you know, most people would not see that. But I'm not sure. But at least it would be, it would be visible. It would be obvious. But the inflationary tax, again, you have this. Because, you know, if you think about this, how does the United States of America, how does it finance its huge budget through increase in taxes? No. By borrowing. And do you know, you know what, is, what is the last uh, update on the, on the American national debt? Last time I checked, it was more than 100% of the GDP. It could be close to huh? you know, as, as a percentage of GDP, do you remember? Well, I mean, so, so it, it's certainly more than 100%. And I think, I think, again, check this out. As far as I remember, the global indebtedness of the world economy is, is more than 200%. Talk about, talk about Marx, and talk about relevance of Marxism. Again, the only way to, to uh, uh, get out of the crisis of all production is credit, and the world economy is credited for more than 200% of the, of the yearly GDP, right? So we're, we're, indebted, we're indebted two years in advance. Uh, David Harvey calls this negative value, <laughs> negative value. I mean, what does, it, what does it boil down to? So it means that people in the world, we're mostly talking about working people, obviously, are all, all, 200% of the GDP at the moment. And they will be forced to work to recoup these 200% of the GDP. Otherwise, if they don't pay, there will be sanctions. Because if you don't pay your debts, bad things happen to you. You know, uh, people in black uniforms knock on the door. And so next time people talk about market freedom, blah, 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 yeah, market freedom, my ass. 200% of the world GDP is in indebtedness. And this is, this is not about freedom, this is about <laughs> It's about wage uh, uh, debt slavery, uh, peonage, basically. So, uh, in some sense, maybe back to serfdom. Well, again, uh, in my concern, I, I, I keep talking about this in, this in critical terms. It's not like it's not like I have a better alternative. I think again, the first step, the first step is to understand how the system works, and this is an in integral part of the system. And in some sense, again, the status quo, the fact that you and me are here in this fabulous room with this uh, brand new, uh, you know, makeup and with all this wonderful technology, is provided for by by this situation. And whether it's good or bad, or it can be done differently, that's a separate point. That's a separate question. So, but again, why am I talking about Hobson with respect to war scene? Because, again, immediately you can see this, how international relations has effect on, on, on national relations. And more specifically, this situation of uh, inequality and domination abroad makes sure that democracy at home will be impossible. And Hobson is an optimist. He's a, he's a liberal. And he thinks that the way to deal with this is through strictly parliamentary means, through reform, uh, of legislation, and more specifically, maybe larger taxation on corporations, that kind of thing. Well, he, he you know, uh, higher taxation on wealth, inherited wealth, that kind of stuff. Um, and this is, this is and, and he wants to go back. He wants to go back to this first competitive stage of capitalism. And it's a good question, because again, when we talk about communism, could you have markets in communism? Could you have some area of the market which is um, circumspected by the uh, broadly socialist organization? And Marx is unclear on this point. My personal opinion is that probably yes, although again, it's a complicated story. Uh -huh. so, so, so maybe when Hobson talks about this, he's not completely unrealistic. But the standard Marxist analysis is that no, you will not be able to do this through parliamentary means. Because again, how? How? The, the countries of the core, sorry, the countries of the periphery are kept down by, by military force. And again, the bourgeoisie in the countries of the periphery are, again, so this is an important, uh, issue which I glossed over. Let me let me return to this. So this system, this system of unequal exchange, is obviously very much in the interest of the of the capital. And again, remember, Marx talks about this. It's not because these people are evil. Remember, there's competition, competition going all the time. And when we talk about this, well, if America decreases its military spending, what's going to happen to the world order? What's going to happen? America decreases its military spending. Now China is the biggest military spender. Is this going to change? I mean, would you, would this be a safer world? Would you prefer to live in that world? I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So this is difficult questions. Again, the status quo is, you could say, is in the interest of the uh, you know uh, top one percent, which is uh, you and me here in this room. On the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, you know, if the military, if, if the United States of America simply unilaterally decreases its spending, what's this going to lead to? Is this going to be better? Notice, Marx is not proposing this. Marx proposes a global movement. That's why the movement has to be global. It cannot be unilateral. United States of America cannot unilaterally decrease uh, military spending. 
That, which is why, again, for Marx, there needs to be a global world revolution. Communism is only achieved as a world revolution. But how do you how do you synchronize the efforts of, of uh, people in the rich countries and in, in, in the poor countries if you have this interesting four tier system? It is in the interest of the bourgeoisie in the advanced countries to keep the system as it is. The proletariat of the advanced countries is pacified through concessions, through breadcrumbs. And again, everybody has something to lose. The bourgeoisie is afraid to change anything because, you know, you understand, the billionaires are getting rich and the millionaires are getting poor. And who knows? Who knows? You know, tomorrow is a market crash. It's a dangerous system. So, again, the bourgeoisie is not evil. They are doing what they have to within the system in order to survive, in order not to become the proletariat. Likewise, the proletariat of advanced countries, Marx talks about how uh, they are supposed to be the driving force behind everything for Marx. They are supposed to be the driving force in the sense that the um, global um, trade, trade union movement has to start with advanced countries. It should be the British workers who help the Irish workers to unionize. It should be, if you want, the Israeli workers who help the Palestinian workers to unionize. But they are afraid. They are afraid to lose their breadcrumbs. They are afraid, afraid to go to become the periphery. Because again, this, this uh, again, in some sense, all of Marx can be summarized as a failed prisoner dilemma game, if you want. And again, this interesting phrase that the history of humanity is not really history; it's prehistory. We are not driving our history forward. We are slaves. We are at the mercy of the global. Uh, uh, economic processes like these processes, for example, and we don't really have any real latitude. It's not up to the elites and it's not up to the proletariat in the advanced countries to change the system. But also, very importantly, the bourgeoisie of the countries of the, of the periphery, they have adapted to the system. Yes, maybe they want you as, as much as possible to gradually move up the ladder, but they would prefer to stay in power, first and foremost. Even if, so, so it's, it is, it's better for them to stay as elites of the periphery rather than to risk changing the system and moving up. They have adapted to not seek to change the system. But basically, all four, well, with the exception of these guys, but these guys, protect of the periphery, they're poor, they're destitute, they're not educated, they're kept down by military force, nothing, they, they cannot do anything. They, they, they are the most powerless of all. But the rest, one, two, and three, instead of trying to overthrow the system, instead of trying to change the system, they are trying to see, they're seeking to gain advantage within the system. And that's why the system perpetuates itself into the future. Um, yeah. So this is a certain preliminary fashion, I hope somewhat clear. And again, 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 remember, this is an ideal time. This is a very conflictual ideal time. Again, the world which is at war with itself, everything at war with itself. Maybe there are some, like in reality, there are some rudiments of the, of the consensus view. But hopefully this gives, again, 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 again. when I, at, at the very beginning, the first class, I said from protons to presidents, from electrons to elections, I mean this very seriously. And well, I hope that by now, we're going to continue this obviously uh, in the next lecture, but I hope that by now, you are getting a certain value for your money in the sense that yes, we have started with the 17 quantum fields, and now we're talking about what goes in the world today. And again, this is obviously this is an idealized model, idealized and oversimplified model, but I think it captures something important about the things that you see when you look outside the window, about this country, or about international politics, about the relation between you know, this Trump, uh, Trump administration fighting with China, what's all that about? You know, to some extent, hopefully, this gives you certain tools to uh, critically understand um, this whole situation. Okay, well, um, I don't want to uh, uh, keep you any further because we technically run out of time, but we will continue this after the break. So if you have any questions, I would be certainly more than happy to answer. Otherwise, I hope I hope that this is stimulating, and I hope that this is you know, a fresh view on uh, economics for you. Uh, uh, and I will see you after the break, and we need to move to a different room as we're doing this, okay?